next year after pitching in Class B, I went to, I jumped all the way to AAA to Montreal, Canada, which was a AAA club with the Dodgers at that time. And we had a lot of great players on there that went on to the major leagues. And <clears throat> I was just lucky enough to make that team. But in, in July, when another pitcher named Tommy Lasorda and I pitched a, a, both, we pitched a double hit of shutouts in Havana, Cuba at the time. And I, I pitched one of them and uh, the next day, the manager, Greg Malivy, called me in his office early in the morning. And uh, I said, oh God, what happened? I said, you know, we just went out and had a couple of beers to celebrate. And he, he said, sit down on that bed, son. So I sat down, he says, you're pitching Sunday. I said, I got up. I said, I know you already told me that. Why'd you tell me? He said, sit down. He said, you're pitching in Brooklyn. I said, what? He said, you're going to the Brooklyn Dodgers and you're pitching Sunday in the first game of a double hitter. I said, oh my gosh. So I ran back to my room and I called my wife. I was in Havana, Cuba, and she was in Montreal, Canada. And the first thing she said to me is, what are you calling me from I, from three different countries? You know, it's going to cost $15, $20, and we can't afford it. I said, well, I'm going to the big leagues. She kept going on, oh, well, it's going to cost too much money. And she almost hung up, hung, hung up on me. And she said, where'd you say you were going? I said, I'm going on pitching in Brooklyn Sunday. And then from there on, it was, it was a a big miracle and a, a big a, a real dream that happened. The first game I saw in the major leagues was July the 16th, 1955. We were playing in Ebbetsfield and uh, play, pitching against Cincinnati. And uh, as I walked in the clubhouse that day, I'll never forget it. I saw guys like Pee Wee Reese and Duke Snyder and Carl Erskine and Don Newcomb, Roy Campanella, Jackie Robinson, Carl Ferrillo, Clem Labine, Johnny Padres. I mean, just, I almost turned around because I said, I don't belong in here. So the manager, uh, the equipment manager, John Griffin, <clears throat> said, kid, come over here. Here's your locker. I said, okay, thank you. And I look, and the locker's about this square back in those days in Ebbets Field. Now they're, they're biggest, biggest, uh, they got televisions and couches in them now. They're really big. But uh, here, here's your locker. So I looked around and said, where? He says, right there. It was a big 10-penny nail about that long. I said, is that my locker? He said, yes. I said, okay with me. I don't care as long as I'm in the big leagues. So after the game, I pitched it. I won it and uh, pitched a three-hitter complete game victory, which is one of the big thrills of my life. So anyway, uh, Walter Austin walked up to me and said, kid, you won't be pitching, uh, I think they, that was on a Sunday, you won't be pitching in the third till we pitched on the fourth day back in the end. He says, why don't you go back to Montreal and get your wife and baby and uh, come on back. And, and uh, I said, okay, so I'm asking the clubhouse guy, John Griffin, and a couple of guys, I didn't really know a lot of guys, I knew Ed Roebuck and Johnny Padres, and I said, how did I get to the JFK. I didn't know what JFK was at the time. I said, I'm, I got to go back to Montreal. And I said, some guys tell me, I said, well, you got to take a subway. I said, what's, what's a subway? I said, go down there two blocks and go down underground. I said, you crazy. I'm not going to do that. And anyway, Jackie Robinson walked up to me and says, hey, kid, come on, I'll take you to the airport. And I was dumbfounded. Jackie Robinson is going to take me to the airport. You know, he, here I'm a southern boy from North Carolina, and here's Jackie Robinson, all the stuff he'd gone through, being the first African-American to play in the major leagues, and I get to ride with him to the... I was hoping he'd drive me all the way to California. But uh, anyway, we rode out there, and I got in the car, and I was nervous and scared, and I, I, I forgot about it. I just pitched a complete game in the major leagues. And he started talking about me. I mean, Roger Craig, he didn't talk about himself, about all the stuff he had gone through and things that happened to him in the South, going in different bathrooms and different motels and stuff like that, which I would witnessed the three years I played with him. But anyway, he drove me out there and he talked about me about said, what I saw today was, he said, you got a chance to be, you got a good arm, you got a chance to be a good major league pitcher. And I said, 
and then I thanked him and all that. I didn't really say a whole lot of things. And I found out when I came back that one of the players said, you know, he went out of his way. I, th I think he lived in, if I'm not mistaken, Connecticut or somewhere to take you to the airport. And I said, oh my gosh. And uh, to this day, every time I see his wife, Rachel, she gives me a hug and we talk about that. But Jackie, if you haven't seen that movie, 42, go see it. It's, it's, he was an unbelievable man. He's, it was unbelievable. He died. At, he had diabetes, and he died at age 53. You know, he got traded in 57 from the Dodgers to the Giants. And he said, I am not going to play for the Giants. He says, the Dodgers gave me, gave me the uh, chance to play, and, and I played for the Dodgers all my career. So that's, that was it. So that's when he retired. He would have been a great manager if he wanted to manage it, but health-wise, I don't know if he could have done it. You know, living in Brooklyn and and riding back and forth with Campanella and Hodges and those guys, it's just, you know, what a dream come to, tr true. And uh, But, you know, they the Dodgers and the Giants at that time had a really a rivalry. If you, you don't know what a rivalry is until you see what happened there because those guys doing batting practice, you walk across the field, and a lot of the guys now, you see them, they come out and they hug each other, op the opposition, and they, we didn't even speak. They told me, to, don't speak to nobody over there. You cannot even speak to them. And that's just how but we played, and we played hard, and then we had brawls and fights, and uh, but that's just the way it was back in, back in those days. They, they didn't have no rule where a pitcher would and knock somebody down if the next time you warned them, you get thrown out of the game, so you could do it whenever you wanted to. And uh, then, the, you know, the Yankees were there. And also, uh, when the, the New York Mets came there, you know, I pitched the first game the Mets ever played, and I was there for two years. And people says, how'd you do that? I said, well, I had 27 complete games. I didn't tell them all about the losses I had. But, you know, we played a series during the middle of the season with the Mets and the Yankees. I mean, it was like... World Series. I mean, the place was sold out. We played through uh, the All Star. No, I don't forgot when it was in the All Star or break. Or anyway, it was a three game series. We played them, you know, the National League against the American League, and it was sold out. And it was just a. I think we beat them the first year, and then the uh, tell you, the people in New York went crazy. You know, see what happens when the Giants and the Dodgers both moved to California. The only team left there was the Yankees. So when the Mets came into focus, there was a lot of uh, National League teams that didn't want to pull for the that pull for the Dodgers and and the Giants that didn't want to pull for the Yankees. So they become Mets fans, and uh, so the Mets were were big time then because uh, they taken over the place of the Dodgers and the and the Giants that moved to the West Coast in the 1958, I believe it was. Mm -hmm.